Hello and welcome back to the Villa Filler podcast. No enthusiastic intro from me tonight. I'm joined as always with my good friend Dan Wiseman. Dan, I'm, I'm not going to ask you how you are today. Um, I asked you that this morning. We had a much better chat this morning. Aston Villa have lost 2-0 away to Manchester City at the Etihad after 80 minutes of, uh, you know, solid football from Villa. Executed the game plan to perfection, but things don't always go your way. The weather wasn't necessarily on Villa's or City side today. Uh, and neither were the officials, as uh, I'm sure we'll come on to later, Dan. But I mean, that, I don't. I mean, I don't even know what to say. I'm, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna eventually stop talking and hope that we <laughs> can offer something to this podcast. Um, the floor is yours. Yeah, I think <laughs> this is this is an unusual intro, mate. I, I, I usually I'm the, I'm the you know we're always I, I feel like the Villa Philip podcast is often the voice of optimism and reason when it comes not to, not for uh, the Villa. sake of it either, not for no. the sake of it. Like we, we, we're fairly and, balanced. Uh, I, we always try and see things in the best possible light. I feel and um, tonight I think more of the same. Really, I think I'm, I'm going to try and focus on those eighty minutes because that for me is the takeaway from this from a sort of just strictly looking at the squad and and how they performed I thought we um I, I wouldn't say that we went toe to toe with Manchester City but why I did think is as you said executed a game plan um the defending was uh, impeccable impeccable uh, I thought to a man that entire back line I thought Ollie Watkins uh, I saw you tweet he was relentless mate and I, I don't think there's a better word for it um, the lads put so much into it. I think uh, the as I said, executing a game plan is definitely the way to say it, mate. And the, the dedication that those boys showed to the cause. We blocked eleven shots against Man City, um, just in the as, as, after about sixty minutes. I think we went on to get about thirteen or fourteen, which would have been the most by a team in the Premier League this season. By sixty minutes, as I said, we put in eleven, uh, which was the second most. Um, the delicate we're just putting bodies on the line and really doing everything we can to try and desperately get something from that game um i think if you're looking for where the game was lost i think naturally we had to set up more defensively in the second half because i think the break that the lads have had have meant that we can't keep that up for 90 minutes we just you know given a lot of the boys out there will have been the 10 or so that had symptoms um and, and obviously tested positive for COVID and obviously that weighs massively on a player's performance. And I think naturally the decision, which was noticeable to go more defensive going into the second half was understood because of that. And I think it was always going to be the case that Villa trailed off after about 60, 70 minutes, just because of, you know, this is the nature of the beast, unfortunately. Um, and I suppose when you give those fine margins, which were pretty even in that game, when the pendulum does seem to swing in that direction towards Man City. I suppose when they're bringing off, you know, bringing on the likes of Jesus and, and Mares, um, they're always going to punish you, aren't they? They are, and this this is a game we didn't preview this game, Dan, because we didn't have the time or felt there was much of a need. We like to kind of incorporate our previews with the post match analysis, um, just because we feel like we can immediately focus on you know either what went wrong or what went well and really highlight that and how that could you know influence the next game which is of course what we'll do with our Newcastle game at the end of this podcast but I list I didn't ever expect Villa to win here and that's the most important thing Manchester City right now are for me nailed on to win the Premier League it's absolutely anyone's game Mm -hmm. at the moment we can still win it (laughs) you know theoretically (laughs) but for me Liverpool, Man- Manchester United, they're both kind of tipping off at the same time. That that Super Sunday game was absolutely atrocious. Uh, Liverpool have not quite been right for the whole season. United have picked picked up form and capitalised on that, but I don't see them carrying on with their upwards trajectory. Uh, obviously, Manchester City is at the top of the league now anyway. Leicester uh, did very well to sit on there you know, for, for the 12 hours or four, uh, 24 hours that they did. But this is a game I didn't expect Villa to win. Which makes it, you know, it hurts that bit more when you put in a performance Definitely like stings, that. Stings, doesn't it? And yep. Yeah, and it was the, it was such a a well, uh, it was a, it was a team performance. That's that's probably the best we've seen the team play, and as I said earlier, execute a game plan in the longest time. Uh, you know, we 
we went and made a very good account of ourselves at the Etihad last season against Manchester City. I felt, and you know, if it weren't if it weren't for some uh, goalkeeping acrobatics from Edison, Keenan Van Nistelrooy would have scored um, and 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 levelled things in that game, which would have been absolutely amazing uh, on, on Halloween weekend. But I feel like we we've we've held a really good account for ourselves and. Uh, you know, I've seen a lot of people be harsh on, on Bertrand on Twitter. And, and to be honest, I feel like he could have done better with the, the shooting opportunity he has. Um, and the weather's probably played into that. The pitch was awful, but, uh, you know, other players didn't have too many issues in terms of, the, you know, setting up the trajectory of their shots fine. Um, I think Bertrand did just kind of pass that ball back to Edison, but we can't we can't pin a 2-0 loss in the you- manner of which it was on that, Dan, can we? Um, it's... But Bertrand, uh, he had to start for me. I think a lot of people before the game, Dan, there was there was the, there was the claims for Anwar, and as we know, we love Anwar on this podcast. He's very hit and miss though, and with 19 days out, you know that Anwar's hot streak could have come to an end. He came on, didn't really offer too much. Uh, again, that's no fault of his own. That's just how the game ended up panning out. It was nice that we saw JJ on the pitch, but I want to give a, a shout out to Matt Target because on I've you know I've used the podcast mm. uh, plenty of times before. A lot of you guys who will be listening and watching this now probably haven't seen it because you know you're all new subscribers. Last season, I pretty much just lambasted Matt Target every week on the podcast. Well, we both and, did. Yeah, we both did. I don't feel good about it. I don't. I'd like to apologise as I have many times before. He has improved his game so much. And I tweeted this and I saw I saw my friend Liam tweet this, Liam Loftus. Shout out to Liam, even though he's a Man City fan. So screw you, Liam. Um, Matt Target has to be, surely, in contention for getting on the Euros, getting on that plan to go to the Euros down in the summer. He, his defensive game has come on leaps and bounds. I feel like neither Chilwell or Saka has been able to really own that position. And I think Chilwell this season has had his uh, defensive incapabilities somewhat exposed. And we've probably seen that Saka's better suited as a winger so far this season as well. And, uh, you know, for a fullback who wants to play in a three or, or a five or however you want to look at it, Matt Target seems to really suit that mould. Yeah, he's come on in leaps and bounds, mate. And look, I think with players and, and you know, I, I came on this podcast and criticised a lot about last season. Um, you know, I wanted a change in the managerial setup. I didn't think Matt Target was good enough. And I've come on this podcast and criticised a lot of players. But, you know, I, I'd like to think that I would say exactly those things if the performances got as bad as they did last season. I, you know, it, it, it's never a, a slight I've had against the players. But, you know, when people are, are, aren't performing, you, you, call for, you call for change uh, eventually. And look, you know, we've... Both we've stuck with the managerial setup and we've stuck with Matt Target, and I, I, mate, I'm I'm really glad that we've done both. I, I think at the end of the day, Matt has shown a desire um, to improve his game. Other players in the squad have improved their game based on competition, and I think that you know that's fair to say of El Ghazi. That's fair to say of Trezeguet. I think Traore has stepped up in recent months, uh, and I think you can only imagine. I think competition is needed for the fullbacks. Just to sort of caveat that, I think, again, it will encourage more out of those players if you go and put players of a similar ilk to challenge them in for that position because ultimately, I, I, I think that's that's what a good squad needs and that's why you see Man City and, and the like being as good as they are is because the competition for places is so high and the quality in that squad is, is just outstanding and that's why you get players like John Stones keeping Amalek Laporte out of the side. Who would have thought that last season? But again, it's just a matter of players wanting to, to reinforce their place in the side. Um, and no, but Matt, both fullbacks are outstanding. Outstanding. I they thought, really you know, but Matt, has, Matt Cash has been really hard done by with, with the handball. Um, I thought we were past those days, to be honest with you. I didn't think that was to be considered a penalty anymore, but you know, that's a different conversation, I, I think. But again, I'm not... I don't want to get drawn into sort of criticising their game because they were so, so good. Matty has really shown, a, like, uh, he stepped up so seamlessly, hasn't he? Yeah. He Matty really Cash, has. this is, he stepped yeah. up from the championship so seamlessly and watching him go to the Etihad tonight and look so comfortable and so at home is, is really testament to him because what a signing he's been and he's added a dynamicism and an ability to be a really good traditional defensive fullback when you need him to, but then show those amazing abilities to bomb on and provide a threat in the other third, the opposite third, when you need him to as well. And I feel like you can deploy Matt 
Cash in, in so many different ways, in so many different games. And he's so comfortable filling the roles. And yeah, you know, here and there, we, we've seen mistakes from him this season. But Villa have asked to, been, asked to do a lot of defending this season. And for a player that stepped up from the championship, when you're asked to defend against the standard of opposition that we play against, at the volume that we have to do it, I think you are going to get mistakes. But yeah. on the whole, 99% of it has been consistent. And I, I'm really proud of both the mats for that. It's really hard to defend against the side who not only move the ball around with ease, but just get about the pitch with ease in general. Um, if you look at the, the the positions that Manchester City end up occupying, uh, especially in comparison to Villa, notably it's, it's heavily favoured on that left-hand side for Villa, which is always going to be the case with uh, the outlet of Grealish, who, to be honest, I didn't think saw that much of the ball. But then again, uh, with the 30% possession that Aston Villa had, uh, you know, no one really saw that much of the ball. So it, it doesn't surprise me too much that 49% of uh, of Villa's attacks came from that left-hand side, especially early on, because we saw a lot of kind of switching of the play with with Barkley drifting out wide. We seen Traore come across a few times as well. We didn't really try and attack that right-hand side too much. And I feel like, that's because the fullbacks that, that, that he started the game with, at least, because obviously Carl Walker came off. We all know his. Um, we all know that Villa play with inverted wingers, first of all. So, attacking on the right hand side when you have a right footed left back in the form of Joao Cancelo uh, is redundant because you know you're coming into that side. So it makes you know it it, it makes sense that we attacked on the left as opposed to the right. But when you look at where City's attacks mostly took place, they're, they're, they're fairly evenly distributed. Now, 40% of City's attacks came from the left-hand side, with 28% coming through the middle, which uh, is, is the least, uh, and 32% coming down the right. That's always going to be the case, especially with how compact Villa were, and that's actually shown in the positions that Villa have occupied. We're in this kind of weird, like, oblong rectangle um that's quite narrow inside the box uh, if i remember to i'll put it on the screen but if not if you check out who scored they have this here and uh and, and what this shows you uh is matt target occupied a position which is uh you know a position you would you'd expect him to occupy um you know in between the byline and the uh the edge of the 18 yard box where, where a fullback occupies what you see with with cash and this could be because Bertrand wasn't the best at tracking his man or, or coming back. Cash ended up tucking inside quite a lot. And I think that comes as well with, uh, you know, the danger of, of ball watching and that. And I'm not just accusing Cash of ball watching. I think there were times where plenty of Villa players were caught ball watching. But there's this thing that City do when they have possession and when they're in possession. You know, they can have it with Walker at right back. And then within five seconds, Phil Foden all the way, at the, you know, who's essentially at the corner flag, has the ball and is in a shooting opportunity. They move the ball so well, but the players also move so well as well, which is why it's so important that we we saw more from Bertrand on the defensive side, which we didn't, which which is a bit of a letdown. And if you look at the position that Bertrand's in as well, considering he's our winger, albeit an inverted one, the average position he occupied was almost identically uh, on the outside of the centre circle. Uh, you know, he was essentially oper operating as a central midfielder. And with how City moved the ball, with how they overload the wings, because City likes to get the ball out wide, cut it back into the box, have the midfield runners score the goal. Especially tonight, they didn't play with a recognised striker until Gabriel Jesus came on. Uh, Matt, he's always going to struggle there. Uh, you know, you need the support there. And uh, I think Target occupied better positions, but was also covered a lot better by the midfield and by Jack on his side. Um, but City just moved the ball around so well. There's nothing more you can say. They are the best team in the Premier League. I, I enjoy watching Manchester City the most. They bore a lot of people, but the football is just so pure. I can't help but 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 marvel when I watch it, honestly. It's uh, you know frustrating that in, in a game like tonight, you know, it's against us and we're on the receiving end of some very poor decisions. But a lot of people who won't have watched the game, and I noticed that, you know, as I said to you before, before we, we came on air, Dan, that Steve McManaman, uh, some very lazy punditry, which is, you know, standard with Steve McManaman, but said, you know, Villa Villa were happy to sit in there. And, of course, the 30% the, the possession uh, will 
maybe back that claim up. But I feel like that's quite a it's quite an easy thing to throw when you've got a team that's pressurizing you as much as Manchester City do. Um, yeah, 40, 41% of the action today came in Villa's third. That was always going to be the case. I think what people don't realize, and this isn't a because you get a lot of Man City fans complain about this. Whenever a team comes to the Etihad, it's 10 men behind the ball and they, they hope to break and, and, and that's it. But I mean, any team that comes to the Etihad and parks 10 men behind the ball with the hopes of scoring a goal on the break doesn't have 11 shots. Villa mm-hmm. attacks this game when they needed to. And we've seen Villa get their better results, Dan, especially against the top sides, especially away from home when they play them on the counter-attack. We've seen Villa perform better with less percent possession than when they Definitely. have more of the possession. And that is that is evidenced in the losses to Brighton and Leeds at home. It's evidenced in the win at Arsenal away. It's evidenced in the win at Leicester away. It's evidenced in, in the, the performance against Chelsea away. Villa performed better out of possession. This isn't a let's put 10 men behind the ball and really hope for the best, which let's be fair, at times it was. Uh, we executed a defensive game plan perfectly, but you're, you're naive to say that Villa came to the Etihad with the vision of parking the bus and hoping for a point. Villa had opportunities, especially as the game grew on, and we're just unfortunate not to not to be able to convert any of these chances into goals. Dan, I mean, notably we had a free kick. Um, there was there was the the slide ball from Ollie Watkins that was played to to Jacob Ramsey, which would have been absolutely amazing had he have come in front of. Uh, Ruben Diaz but I mean the pairing of Ruben Diaz and John Stones is is you know one I I, I think will be uh, a generational pairing like uh, very much like Rio and Vidic for United that looks that looks set to be the centre-back pairing for the next mm-hmm. five to ten years for Manchester City uh, but yeah to, to kind of come back to my point Dan to, to say the 30% possession that Villa has was um you know we, we were playing into City's hands or whatever it's just naive I think well, I think ultimately it comes down to the fact that it's, as you say, it's very easy to say that, isn't it? When when teams go to Man City, I think a lot of teams go to Man City and would like to play a lot more football than they seem to do. But it's just so difficult to counter at against City because A, they're so set up to deal with that. They're so aware when you have players that, you know, when you play with, because City often play with inverted fullbacks. It's not often sort of... Um, they make underlapping runs rather than overlapping ones. You you see it with Cancelo a lot that Cancelo yeah. often appears to be playing like a winger. You sort of see him on the on the penalty spot taking shots. You know he hit that bar with that one shot, and it provides a real weapon. And when your centre backs are doing that and they're almost level with your strikers, Man City are so set up to deal with counter attacks. And the way that they deal with that, not being funny, is with fouls. Like we Villa had thirty three percent possession, but Man City still committed more fouls than Villa did. Um, you know, David Silva goes down as this sort of baby faced assassin. I've, the, there aren't many dirtier players in the Premier League. You go back and watch yeah. David Silva games, he hacks players down for fun. And because he's got this cute little face, he, he, he very rarely got away with it. But Man City, you watch them, you know, you got, you, it, it goes under the radar. But whenever a side gets an, on the ball and they're looking to act in transition, there's a foul straight away. Yeah. But Fernandinho does, has, has gained a real reputation for doing it. And it's, it, it's, you know, I'm not criticising that. It's it's a tactic of, of the modern game. And, and Villa did it as well, you know. Um, McGinn picked up a booking, I think, for, for doing exactly that. It, it's part and parcel of such a transition-based 21st century game. Um, but Man City are so difficult to, to go and play football against because you are aware that you have to act so instinctively, so quickly when you get the ball. There's no time to be laborious and build play like they do because you, you spoke of their ability down to just all of a sudden Flick into gear and they're, and they're away. They have this ability and you've always felt like it with City, even when they weren't performing at the start of the season, that all of a sudden, all it takes is that little sequence on the edge of the barrier and bang, there's that sixth gear and it's been cut back from the byline. It's been tapped into two yards from goal. It happens time and time and time again. Uh, Man City are, are never more than a few minutes away from just turning into some a, a completely different beast altogether. Um, and I think when you look at how Villa then tried to deal with that, I think we did really as, as well as we could. Um, I think we we had a really good defensive shape and we tried to get out and counter whenever we could. It's never easy against Manchester City. Their their side is, is, is far, far superior to the one that we've got. But I thought we did really well, mate. I thought we did really well. And I think that kind of game uh, is why you want Morgan Sanson because ideally I don't think you want to be, you know, I'm, I'm not saying he came on and played badly or anything like that, but I don't think you want to be bringing on Jacob Ramsey 
there. I think you, you, you want to be coming on and uh, bringing on a midfielder that can change the tide, um, that can come on for Ross Barkley and provide something different, act in that six come eight role and be the sort of quarterback to play the balls forward to get you out on the counter attack. Um, and, and hopefully, you know, with, we should probably mention that obviously they've announced Connor's gone permanently. Um, yeah, good luck to him. Uh, and hopefully Santon will, will come in and, and provide that. But um, no, it was, it was always going to be difficult, mate. And uh, I think, as you say, scoring against Man City, that they've conceded in one game. And even then, that was one goal in the game against Chelsea uh, since they played Arsenal in the EFL Cup quarterfinals, which is way back almost a month ago, the 22nd of, of December that was. And, um, you know, you've, since then, they've played Man United, they've played uh, Chris Palace, Newcastle, Blues, Brighton. So that's, that's five games they've kept clean sheets in. Um, that centre back partnership is, is an absolute wall, mate. It's, it's no easy feat going to the Etihad and getting goals. No, it's not. Uh, you know, we were looking at two sides who have the two best defensive records as well in the league go head to head. So you knew that there was going to be more than one goal. That's just how things work. But to back your point up, Dan, about uh, the, the, you know, the inverted wing, wing backs that, and, and that kind of emphasis that, that C actually play. Um, Cancelo had the third highest amount of shots in the Man City team with three. Uh, you know, he was, he was causing the threat on both sides, you know, at, both at left back and at right back when he switched. Caused Villa all kinds of problems. But um, I think we've, we've, we've spoken about, I think we've broke the game down enough, Dan, for us to, to go on to the, uh, the VAR chat and the referee chat because John Moss is nothing short of an absolute disgrace. Now, I believe I believe the new rules state that Mings has technically played the ball, which means a new phase has begun. That's bullshit. I'm just going to say it. That's that's crap. That's that is that is stupid. How can a player who is 25 yards offside? He's standing in an offside position 25 yards. The minute Mings touches the ball. He's suddenly back. He's round. He's one that there's no way you can you can say a phase has officially moved on if you don't have control of the ball. For me, that is absolutely ludicrous. And you know, you had you had the referee on BT Sport. Uh, was it Peter Banks say that it it was uh, it, you know it, it should have been offside? Twitter has exploded. I have exploded. We've all exploded. The goals given, but I think. You know what? Just as stupid then to go and give a penalty for that. You know, shocking handball decision on Matty Cash soon after. Vars really ruined this, Dan. This is ru- it's ruined the game. I can take losing. I can absolutely take losing, especially against a side like Manchester City, especially when we've played so well. I have no quarrels with that. But when we, it's the manner in which these decisions are coming, and I've got to be honest, Dan, I can't title another podcast "Var Var Ruins the Game." I can't. <laughs> I've done it too many times this season. I'm running out of titles. Yeah, no, I, I'm just going to call right, John Moss a twat in this one. Like, <laughs> what can I do? I've got. No, I don't know what to title this because it's the same as like eight other podcasts we've done this season. It's a joke. Yeah, no. Yeah, you're absolutely right, mate. You're absolutely right. It, it feels like every game there's contentious VAR decisions. Um, you know, I, I tweeted just after the game um, that, I, you know, maybe I'm, I'm playing devil's advocate. Uh, I, I, I think the offside not like call... <laughs> I, 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 um, I think the offside call, I can see it both ways. Uh, I think I, I can see what you're certainly saying, Dan. I think it's wrong how a player can come back from t- sort of 25, 30 yards offside and... Uh, be in an offside position and, and just because Mings has touched the ball um, be played onside but you know if, if we are sort of reading this down to the letter of the law then just because Mings has touched it doesn't I suppose it doesn't really matter what kind of touch it is it's no different to him passing the ball through to Rodri playing him through on goal I suppose if you're playing it to the letter of the law so as soon as the defender touches it and it falls to him he's played onside but I can see both sides of the coin on that one to be honest it wasn't really the one that annoyed me the thing that most annoyed me about that goal was what Mings was doing in the first place um but that you know that that I, I, what I, what does again, he do dan what does he do there i i think i think with this is again again i see both sides of the coin because you know I, i've sort of got group chatting with my mates and they were saying that ming's uh, you know it's another mistake it's another mistake and i was like i don't think he needs to anticipate 
that a player is coming from that direction. Yeah. You know, I, 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 again, like, you know, how is Mings supposed to expect that Roger is going to come charging back from 25 yards offside to tackle him? But then again, if you want to be competing at the top end of the Premier League and you want to be going to play in Europe, I think you have to have that awareness to know where the players around you are at all times. I think it's it's harsh. And look, I'm not criticising Mings. I, I think, again, when you defend the volume of attacks that Man City threw at you, you, you you're going to make mistakes. And, and look, it's a shame that it's tied because I thought, you know, you tweeted as well, mate. I thought he was an absolute uh, mountain at the back. But the, the decision that, that's annoyed me more is the Matt, Matt Cash. I thought those handballs that Matty Cash has been penalised for was was no longer a handball. I thought, you know, they'd, they'd had that review mid-season um, whereby, you know, if it, a player is that close and it's coming at him at that pace and there's never any intention to to deliberately move his hand there or to try and block the shot, it's just a matter of ball to hand, wasn't it? That that, that old, yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't know if that's a cliche or is that whether that was ever in the rule book, but it felt like that, mate. Um, and that's oh, what yeah. confused me is, yeah, is it, is it sort of what is that again you know if, if that gets called in October I don't think you can say too much about it because whilst it's harsh handballs were given for that all the time weren't they yeah you know that, that was happening almost every week we were seeing incidents like that but since they had that mid-season review and that wasn't going to be considered a handball anymore uh, that confused me a little bit and that's probably what I got more angry at personally I think um, the, the offside is is sort of contentious and I've you know I put that tweet out and I've seen Villa fans agree with me I've seen Villa fans disagree with me so I, I think that just if I you know depends on <laughs> I'd say what side of the line you lie on but that's probably too contentious isn't it I think Very, uh, yeah. yeah yeah absolutely I think um but no I think the, the real the real debate is um is on uh is on the have a penalty incident mate and it felt like but to be honest with you, once that goal went in, I think given the valiance of the performance we've shown until that point, it just really felt a bit dejected. And I always, you always felt like City were going to go and get another. I just was disappointed that it came as a result of a penalty given for that. Yeah, and I'm not quite clued up on the rules in terms of managers getting sent off or the the consequences of that. But Dean Smith, I mean. John Ross, Jonathan, Jonathan, I said Jonathan Ross. Then it's not Jonathan Ross. May as well have been Jonathan <laughs> Ross. Yeah, I was going to say game. He probably could have done better. <laughs> yeah, but but John Moss, he's he, you, people know what he's like. He's an he is an awful referee, and I can say that because there's no repercussions. John Moss is the worst referee in the Premier. Everyone likes to go on about Kevin Friend and the Henry Lansbury goal, and that was a tragedy. You know, travesty. We all know that. The fact that John Moss has uh, recently celebrated. 10 years of officiating in the Premier League. They, they made a point of that on the commentary on BT. And I'm sure he was the only one celebrating those 10 years. Not even his family would have celebrated them. He has been a God-awful referee. He had an awful game today. And you just know he felt so vindicated giving Dean Smith that red card. And you know what? I don't even care. Dean Smith, he, he spoke his mind. It was an outrageous decision. And to give him the yellow card anyway, that's just pathetic. John Moss has to just get over himself. I'm sorry. If you can't take criticism, get out of the fucking kitchen. Do you know what I mean? And second yeah, of all, no. fair play to Dean for actually, you know, calling him out and, you know, saying whatever he said. I'm not going to repeat it. I've already swore too much on this podcast and I don't like doing that. But fair play <laughs> to Dean for actually speaking your mind when you got sent off because it doesn't matter anyway. You're just going to have to pay a fine. And, you know, it's not ideal. But listen, John Moss is a disgrace. Anyway, now that's out of my system. Um, <laughs> now that is out of my system Dan there are positives to take into this and we play Newcastle next at home and given how just god awful Newcastle are as well I don't think Villa can feel too sorry for themselves for too long no I don't mate I, I don't I, and to be honest with you I think that we can take real positives from this I think we've gone to the Etihad and people are really respecting the performance that Villa has put in and I think when you have um you know, that, that sort of respect from opposition fans and stuff like that, that really clarifies what a good job you've done. And I felt that Villa did a really good job of nullifying City. And again, it's just providing entertainment and going to teams and, and proving that we can play well. But at the end of the day, mate, and I've said this throughout the season, doesn't matter if you go to the Etihad and play well, doesn't matter if you go to Stamford Bridge, Old Trafford, the Emirates, whatever. If you're not taking points from Newcastle at home, from unfortunately Burnley at home, We've got Burnley away after this. So again, you've got to take points there. We've then got West Ham, Brighton at home coming up in, in sort of within a month. Um, 
you've got to take points from those games. Otherwise, all of the hard work that you've done at these bigger teams in these bigger stages doesn't matter because those were the undoings of us you know, um, last season and have been this season, ultimately. You know, we can't have too many games like we have had against yep. Brighton at home, against Leeds at home, um, against Burnley at home. And, I, and it, I, there's a common theme to all of those performances mate is that they came at Villa Park we tend yeah we tend to do a lot better away and I think that I'd like to think that the Crystal Palace game has perhaps put that hoodoo to bed and it feels crazy to think that we haven't played at Villa Park for almost a month um it's going to be really nice to get back there but we uh, it's only three days this is going to be a squad that is going to be really feeling this game um but there's no excuses for me going into this one mate it has to be three points given how Newcastle are playing as well it has to be three points yeah, I think the thing is as well, as I said, never expected us to win this game against Manchester City. So it was a good opportunity for the players to get, uh, you know, some energy back in the legs, which is, is much needed. You know, Villa hadn't played for 19 days and we don't know how bad the side effects of COVID were. Uh, John McGinn even said before the match, he absolutely despises training in general, let alone having to do it from home. Um and, you know, there's no better time to play Newcastle. There really isn't. It seems like we could be the final nail in the coffin for Steve Bruce at Newcastle, which I'm sure the North East would, would absolutely love. Uh, it would be quite poetic to see him lose his job uh, against, uh, you know, Aston Villa. That, that, there is some poetry to that. Um, but looking at how they've played and... Actually, it was it was uh, it was the Monday night football game this week um, when they play. It was Arsenal, um, and Gary Neville and Jamie Carragher. Um, as much as I love the two of them, and I think they're great, Gary Neville was so clearly pro Bruce, and he tried to make this point of well. I've not spoke to him for eight years. That doesn't change shit, Gary. I'm sorry. It doesn't. And then you've got Jamie Carragher on the other hand as well, who's so pro Rafa. And I'm not, I'm not being, you know, they both clearly have allegiances to either manager, right? I think what we can say safely about both of them, they both should have done better and they both should do better, yeah. regardless of how many points they got or how, you know, what everything that was being debated there. Newcastle have been so poor and, we're going to have to hope that someone like Alan and Maximan, or you know, as crude as this sounds, isn't available to play because he's been suffering with long COVID. Uh, you know, he's been having breathing issues. So he, if he's not around, but Newcastle looked hopeless the other night. They really did. So the, I, I believe there is no better time to play them. Games are coming around thick and fast. So make sure, guys, you subscribe to the channel for more updates. Hopefully, Morgan Sanson is announced soon. Uh, as as we you know, we've got the news today that Conor Horan has departed. Wish him all the best at Swansea. I believe his next game is actually Norwich, and he always scores against Norwich. So maybe maybe oh, yeah. a fiver on that. But that's not. This isn't financial advice. Uh, gamble safely, gamble responsibly, all that jazz. Um, and if you enjoyed this podcast, uh, or you know, just just like it for for my sake anyway, because I'm going to have to think. We of need it. We need have to think it tonight. Of it. Yeah. <laughs> We, do, we really do. Uh, uh, thank you to everybody who has subscribed. We've recently uh, surpassed 3,700 subscribers, which is absolutely amazing. If you guys are watching this and not subscribed, really appreciate it if you turn your phone, you know, so you can see the like and the thing, press the subscribe button, press the like button. Uh, that would that would it's really free. help us out. It's free, exactly. Uh, you know, the best things in life are free. Um, and comment your thoughts below on the game. Uh, you know, I'm I'm I'm. As, as disappointed and upset and frustrated as I've sounded at points, I am genuinely so proud of the performance tonight. Um, it is no one's fault apart from apart from the, the officials. Uh, but you know, I've 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 give my I've give my tuppence on that. So yeah, as I say, if you enjoyed this podcast, hit the like button, comment your thoughts below, and subscribe for more content. Up the villa. <laughs>